afternoon. We're going to go ahead and jump in and get started. I'd like to introduce our speakers today. We have Erica Korn, who has more than 30 years of professional experience and has spent the majority of her career advising clients on state and local tax issues. Through her advice and advocacy, Erica has saved her clients millions of dollars in taxes. Erica has experience in a wide range of industries. John Wartenberger joins us and has more than 10 years of experience providing audit, assurance, and consulting services to clients of various sizes and in various industries. John assists clients with key technical accounting issues, implementation of accounting standards, valuation of goodwill and intangible assets, among other services. And with that, I will kick it off to Erica Horn to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Jenny. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this, uh, the next two slides contain the recovering lawyer's disclaimer. That's a description of me. Um, so the matters discussed in these materials are for general information only. Um, you should uh, talk with someone that you trust to guide you with business decisions or provide input, I should say, before you uh, act on this information. You don't, we wouldn't want you to, to uh, not have all the details specific to your situation. Um, next slide. And then um, we're going to talk today about the Paycheck Protection Program loans. And I'll call them, or John might call them PPP loans or loans or paycheck loans. You'll know what we're talking about. The program is part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act called the CARES Act. Um, the forgiveness piece of this program is um, in Section 1106 of the CARES Act, and that is all the guidance that we have uh, for the most part right now about forgiveness. There have been a few um, references to forgiveness in what are called um, interim final rules, which are the SBA's draft regulations. Uh, what little information is in there, we've picked that up and incorporated it. As a result of that information and the information in the CARES Act itself, sometimes there will be a conflict, um, and we'll point those out to you when we're aware of them. Uh, we have been waiting now since at least, um, well, we've been waiting more than a couple of weeks now for the SBA to issue additional guidance about um, how to calculate forgiveness. Their most recent teaser that they would be um, issuing that guidance came on Sunday night, I think, when in an answer to a frequently asked question, uh, they said, and we'll be providing more information on this soon. Uh, so we're waiting on that. Um, you are probably, if you got this invite and joined today, already on our e-blast list when we have information about forgiveness, we will um, push that out as soon as John and I and others have had a chance to digest it and figure out what it means. Um, hopefully um, that won't take us too long. Uh, and then if you feel like you've missed it or if you just want to check, you can see our website for the latest information. Erica, I'll talk a little bit about uh, maximizing your forgiveness. Um, or trying to maximize your forgiveness. And quite honestly, as Erica alluded to, um, we have been anxiously awaiting uh, new guidance released by the SBA to address some of the existing questions that a lot of people have, including ourselves, around the forgiveness calculation, the components of that, the time period involved. So um, if you have all the answers to that, then quite honestly, you probably don't need to be on this webcast. You probably need to be teaching your own webinar. Uh, but, but we do know, as Erica mentioned, uh, what's in the CARES Act right now and the limited information that we do have uh, available based upon the, the other interim final rules that have been released to date. So that being said, um, we'll go over some, some known ways to maximize your forgiveness at this point. Um, and then touch on maybe some of the questions later on as well. Um, and just to, just to go ahead and give a high-level overview, these, each one of these bullets, we're going to go into a little bit more detail on subsequent slides. So uh, I may touch on them on a high level, but, but the intent uh, for the webinar is to spend a little bit more uh, time on each one of these. So 
the first thing to keep in mind uh, when, when trying to maximize your forgiveness is make sure you're spending um, the loan proceeds on forgivable uses and within the covered period. So both those, uh, those terms, forgivable uses, and also the covered period, we'll go into in a little bit more detail and define those for you in subsequent slides. You wanna make sure that you're spending at least 75% on payroll costs. This was not something that was initially in the uh, original version of the CARES Act, but came out in a subsequent interim final rule by the SBA. And they specifically stated that they expect that at least 75% of the loan proceeds will be used on payroll costs. And then that same 75% is also applicable to the for forgivable uses. Because in that same interim final rule, the SBA also limited forgivable uses to be 25% of, so non-payroll costs should be 25% of your forgivable uses, which indirectly makes payroll costs 75%. So you wanna make sure you're spending at least 75% on payroll. The third item is you wanna to try to just broadly maintain historical levels related to average full-time equivalents and salary and wages for employees during the covered period. The CARES Act goes into uh, a lot of detail around a couple of different reductions that might be um, potential, some potential reductions to your forgiveness amount. And that could be reductions related to full-time equivalent employees, as well as reductions to salaries and wages related to employees. So if there's questions on the, what the, how this reduction calculation works, um, what exactly is a full-time equivalent employee, uh, what is the full quarter comparable period for salaries and wages. So we, we expect there to be additional guidance addressing those questions released whenever that, that becomes available. But at this point, the easiest way to tell people to try to avoid a reduction to the extent that you are in your covered period right now with your loan and you've received your loan proceeds is to try to maintain those historical levels of what you paid those employees as far as salaries and wages, as well as what your, your historical level of full-time equivalents are. So the CARES Act specifically states a couple different comparable periods um, that you wanna make sure and, and take into consideration when evaluating your forgiveness amount during your covered period. Related to average full-time employee or full-time equivalent employees, if you're a non-seasonal business, the CARES Act defines two different historical periods that you may elect as your comparable period um, when looking at average full-time equivalents during your eight-week covered period. Those two options are February 15th, 2019 through June 30th, 2019, or January 1, 2020 through February 20. So said another way, a non-seasonal business can choose from either of those periods and look at what their average FTEs were during one of those, during either of those periods and compare it to what your average FTEs are during your eight weeks. And then for the salaries and wages piece, the, co the comparable period is actually different. It's not a, a defined date range, whether it's February 15th through June 30th or January 1 through February 2020. Um, it's actually the defined as the most recent full quarter that the employee received wages prior to the covered period. So instant questions on that as far as what is that most recent full quarter? Is it the day before your covered period begins and backing up 12 weeks? Or is it the most recent full quarter based upon your company's fiscal year? At this point, that's unknown. Um, and so there's question marks related to that that we expect uh, to be answered. But the easiest way is just try to maintain those historical levels during your eight-week covered period where you have to use the loan proceeds. On the next slide, we have a couple more points uh, related to maximizing your forgiveness. So specific to spending average full-time equivalent employees and employee salary and wages, you want to make sure that you're retaining documentation for all those things. So documentation, documentation, documentation. So uh, utmost importance uh, related to on the back end of this applying for forgiveness and trying to um, justify what you spent those loan proceeds on. So you want to make sure that you're retaining documentation to how you're spending your loan proceeds, what those average full-time equivalent employees were during your, your eight-week covered period, as well as those historical periods that we just covered, in addition to employee salary. And then lastly, 
if there were any reductions in full-time equivalent employees or employee salary and wages that occurred between February 15th and April 26th, 2020, you want to make sure you're trying to restore or eliminate those reductions on or before June 30th, 2020. The CARES Act refers to a, a couple exemptions that exist and they refer to it as the rehire exemption. And it's specific to reductions that occurred between that time period of fifth, February 15th and April 26th, 2020. So if there were any reductions in employee salary wages or FTEs during that period, you want to try your best to restore or eliminate what that reduction was on or prior to June 30th. Okay. So the first step. So that, as John said, that's an that's an overview. Um, and and as as we started at the outset, so this this program is uh, the result of a statute. And in statutes, all the words mean something, and a lot of times the words are defined. And so it, you've already struggled with what does payroll cost mean, because when you first started applying for the loans, um, there was a lot of confusion about what was meant by payroll costs. And probably after you applied for the loan, um, the SBA came out and issued an interim final rule that defined payroll costs, or a frequently asked question, actually. Um, and let me just break away there to tell you, if you use your favorite search engine um, and you look for the U.S. Department of Treasury, at the top, um, it has information about small business loans or something like that uh, on a red ribbon. If you click on that, um, it will take you to all the guidance they have issued. That is the most up-to-date source of all the relevant information. So it's the U.S. Department of the Treasury, uh, and then click on the small business information, and, um, and it'll take you to that page. And you'll see general information, then um, information for lenders, information for borrowers, frequently asked questions is in there, the interim final rules are in there. So that, that is the, the place to look. Um, so in, in the part of the statute that talks about how you can use the money, that's allowable uses of money. It says you can use it on payroll costs. It says you can use it on interest on um, indebtedness secured by a mortgage. Uh, you can use it on rent and utilities. You can use it on other indebtedness, interest on other indebtedness, not principal payments. And then depending on if you received an economic injury disaster loan and the time period within, you, within which you received it, you may have been forced to refinance that um, economic injury disaster loan. And if you were, then obviously that becomes an allowable use. Um, so that, that's allowable. Now you'll notice that forgivable is a subset of allowable. So it's not all the same thing. So forgivable is payroll costs. So that's what it's all about, right? Once again, we get interest on secured debt, uh, rent, and utilities, uh, but not interest on other indebtedness and not refinance of certain economic injury disaster loans. Um, the use of the word certain there is meant to describe uh, the time frame within which they were issued. So uh, this, this is important uh, to pay attention to. So you might have other debt and it's permitted um, that you can pay the interest on it, but you just need to know when you use the money for that amount, that amount won't be forgiven. Um, on the uh, second bullet, the interest on secured debt. So in the uh, allowable column, the language of the statute specifically says um, indebtedness, interest on mortgage indebtedness, more or less. In the forgivable portion of the statute, it says interest on uh, indebtedness, um, mortgage indebtedness for real or personal property. So typically we don't see mortgages on personal property. We see mortgages on real property and UCC1 filings, uh, if you have that, you're accustomed to that, on the personal property. So that's been abbreviated by myself here and others as interest on secured debt. We've been asked, does that include floor plan financing? Uh, and and the, the 
the answer is we're not 100% sure, but it certainly seems like it would. Um, so uh, utilities, we've been asked what constitutes utilities. Most frequently we've been asked uh, whether or not that includes internet, and it does. It's traditional uh, utilities, gas, electric, telephone, sewer, water, um, internet, uh, and then there's one other item in there that's not uh, particularly applicable to most, unless you're uh, an industrial user. If you're an industrial user, um, it refers to transportation. This is part of utilities. Uh, what I think that was intended to cover, although it's been broadened a little bit, I think that was intended to cover uh, if you pay two separate vendors, one for your actual electricity or gas, and another entity for delivery of that gas or that um, electricity, then that's the transportation that they're referring to. So some industrial users have uh, have that arrangement where they buy the gas uh, on the open market uh, and then pay separately um, for the transportation of that gas to their, to their place of business. Um, so here's your next polling question. We'll see if we can do better for this time. The list of allowable uses is longer than the list of forgivable uses, true or false. The list of forgivable uses is longer than, I'm sorry, the list of allowable uses is longer than the list of forgivable uses, true or false. We expanded your time a little bit and I started reading before Jenny had a chance to change the slides, so you should have plenty of time. While you're voting, oh, okay, now we just have to wait for your answers to pop up. I forgot to say on that other slide, it's critical that you document your uses of the money during the um, time frame, during the, the eight-week covered period. Documentation includes your payroll runs uh, for the eight weeks that are included in the covered period, um, interest or mortgage statements, um, and then uh, whatever reflects your payments on, of interest on the debt, uh, rent. If you don't get a rent um, invoice or something like that, perhaps you can ask your landlord to create that or your lease agreement will create that. We have interpreted rent to include common area maintenance because um, they're not going to let you stay if you don't pay the common area maintenance. Uh, and then a couple of utility bills. So you want to put all those things together, uh, put it in your PPP at loan file uh, so that when you're, oh, your Form 941, sorry about that, your health insurance or retirement benefit statements where you've made the contributions, the matching contributions to the 401k, uh, paid your health insurance premiums for your employees, and um, then your state unemployment taxes. Uh, if you're a Kentucky business are included, your state unemployment taxes are included regardless of what state you're in. Uh, so your Kentucky unemployment tax return or your state equivalent, whichever state you're in, if you're in a state where there are local unemployment taxes, those would also be included. So you'll want to make sure you have your documentation for that. So most of you, very good, got correct um, that those forgivable um, uses are fewer than the allowable uses. And so I'm confident you'll be aware of that going forward. Now John's going to talk to us about the covered period. Yes, so the covered period. Mentioned this earlier and, um, and told you that we would spend a little bit more time defining exactly what that is. So the covered period actually means a couple different things under the CARES Act, depending on what exactly you're referring to. So the first point on the slide refers to general use of the fund, so general use of the loan proceeds. Um, the covered period ends for the general use of the proceeds on June 30th, 2020. Um, that essentially means that you are able to use the loan proceeds that you receive up until June 30th, 2020. Now, we fully expect this to get amended and extended in the next wave of guidance that we receive. If you just sit down and you think about the second wave of the PPP loan borrowers and when they're, when they're expected to receive their funds. There are some out there right now that are currently waiting to receive their funds. 
And so even if you were to receive the funds today, um, then you would be right on the cusp of that June 30th um, end date. And, and there's going to be people who are receiving the second waves of the funds uh, beyond today. So just naturally, that period has to be extended to allow um, those borrowers who haven't yet received their funds to be able to use them over a, a full eight month period. So that's the general use of the funds. When you talk about forgiveness, um, the, the CARES Act defines the covered period as eight weeks from when a borrower receives the disbursement from the lender of the loan. So once you receive that disbursement, once it hits your bank account, once you're able to use those funds, that day starts the beginning of your eight weeks. So in an example, um, assume that a borrower receives their loan proceeds from a lender on April 15, 2020. Those loan proceeds, in order to be eligible for forgiveness, must be spent by June 10, 2020. Now, if the borrower is not worried about forgiveness, then they can continue to use those loan proceeds after June 10, 2020, but before June 30, 2020. And so, and those loan proceeds can still be used on allowable um, costs, as Erica covered earlier. It just might not, they're just not going to be eligible for forgiveness if they extend beyond that, that end date of the eight weeks. So the point being in this is that as borrowers, um, the, the companies need to carefully calculate what that end date of that eight week period is so that they know when they need to use those loan proceeds by in order to be eligible. You also just need to be mindful of the current end date for the allowable uses and general use of the loans, which ends on June 30th. Okay. So the magic 75% rule. As John alluded to at the beginning, uh, this 75% rule is not in the statute. It's in the in first interim finding final rule issued by the SBA. Uh, we got a hint of it um, in the borrower application where it said they anticipated the program would be oversubscribed and therefore they were going to limit uh, the, the program such that 75% should be spent on payroll. Um, so the very first problem um, that we have with this statutory language is 75% of what? Actually, not, not statutory language. It's a regulatory language by the agency, the SBA. Um, is it 75% of the loan proceeds? Uh, which will put a real hardship on all businesses. Or is it 75% of the forgiveness amount? So I haven't counted the specific number of references to the time frame, but let's just for sake of example say there are 10. Out of those 10 references, I would say that two of them are to the loan amount and eight of them are to forgiveness. So there's a lot more references to the 75% being applied to the forgiveness amount or the forgivable amount. Uh, now that would be both payroll and the other items, interest rate utilities that are forgivable. Uh, at least that's what with, appears to be the case. That's a, this is a great example of a place where uh, what uh, SBA puts out could vary from what I'm saying. So um, there may be more than one way. You can interpret it as 75% of the loan and proceeds, or you can interpret it as 75% of the forgiveness amount. Um, in either event, uh, it is, it's going to be difficult in some instances, especially if your business is still closed and you don't know when you're going to open um, to meet that threshold. If you can't spend um, all of the money within, within the relevant period, we suggest that you keep that money. Don't spend it on something else uh, so that you can pay it back um, at, at the same time that you're, you learn what your forgivable costs are that have been forgiven uh, unless you're prepared to pay it back over the life of the loan, which is fine. I mean, clearly it's a low interest loan, so, so that's what it's there for. Um, John mentioned earlier, and he's gonna talk about it some more, about these potential reductions in loan forgiveness. 
In addition to that 75%, as he said, there is a reduction if your full-time equivalents for the cover period are different than your full-time equivalents for one of these two base periods. Um, and there is a, a reduction in, um, in the amount of loan forgiveness if uh, you don't restore FTEs or salaries and wages of certain employees at certain amounts uh, to their full place um, if they were laid off between February 15th and April 26th. That's a really hard calculation. Everybody wants us to do it, and we really want to do it too. Um, and we want to do it now because you want to know now. And so that that's, that is absolutely where we all are. Um, it's just not straightforward, and, and just like John said a minute ago, I mean, questions arise uh, right away in terms of, of how that works. So um, I think I stole a little bit of John's thunder because we're the next slide is document, 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 but this will help us reiterate that information for you. Yeah, yeah, no, no worries, Erica. And Erica, quick question, I guess. Do we know exactly what may happen if um, somebody doesn't hit that 75% threshold? Yeah. Yeah, so um, people have um, speculated uh, that there is, a, there is a way of reading this literature that says if you don't spend 75% of the loan proceeds, you don't get any forgiveness. Now, I, I think because of the number of people who aren't going to be able to spend 75% of the loan proceeds, that if that is the interpretation that we see, um, that there will be some significant backlash that could cause a reversal of, uh, of the decision, which um, is what we're seeing with the IRS's guidance about whether or not um, expenses paid with amounts that are forgiven are deductible. And the other day, the IRS came out and said, no, we're not including the interest, I mean, the, the income, the cash as income, so no, you don't get to deduct um, the items. And Congress members immediately came out and said, that's not what we meant. So I would think that if they applied the 75% that way, John, we would get a bunch of Congress people saying, hey, we didn't put that in there in the first place, and that is certainly not what they can mean. So um, I don't think that will be the answer, but it's out there. It's haunting us. Yeah, yeah, definitely one of those questions that we hope to get some clarity on, I think. So, um, so moving on to, to, to the slide that's on the screen right now, um, as you can tell by the, by the slide title, um, documentation, as I mentioned earlier, is just going to be so important um, on the back end of this as people go and fill out whatever that loan forgiveness application ends up looking like. But um, you want to make sure that you're retaining documentation throughout, you know, the, the period from when you get your loan proceeds to when essentially you, you've spent them all or, or paid them all back. And specific to forgiveness, you want to make sure that you're retaining documentation related to your payroll costs. Um, which includes those health insurance payments and retirement benefit payments. Um, you want to make sure that you're retaining uh, supporting documentation related to covered mortgage interest payments and covered rent and utilities. As Erica mentioned earlier, um, some examples of, of types of documentation that, that borrowers should expect to retain are canceled checks, uh, payment receipts, account statements. Um, we, we've heard of numerous instances where borrowers are receiving their funds um, and setting up a separate bank account for, the, for that or keeping those funds isolated away from their general operating accounts so that that will help them track the use of those funds better. Um, anything that you can do to uh, more efficiently and effectively track the flow of those funds and back them up with supporting documentation, we would recommend at this point. Um, one of the, the last point on here around you know, borrowers must certify that, that the records that they're providing are identical, identical to those provided to the IRS, um, that will be one of those certifications that will be on the loan forgiveness application. Um, and as we saw on the front end of this, with, with the different lender applications, each different lender might require a, a different amount of supporting documentation. So, so my best recommendation at this point would be to start coordinating with your lenders, start asking about what types of supporting documentation they're going to want to see um, in addition to that loan forgiveness application that borrowers are going to be required to fill out and make sure that you're trying to do that on the front end um, rather than trying to scramble and, and find historical documents on the back end. 
Um, and, and we've mentioned it a couple different times on this uh, webinar, but um, you know, you'll want to make sure in addition to the payroll cost and covered uh, payments that we mentioned above, you're maintaining the documentation for those average full-time equivalent employees and also salary increases. Um, you'll want to do that for a number of things uh, when you're thinking about you know, what those averages and what those payments are during the eight covered period compared to those historical periods that you have the option of selecting, um, but also to potentially avoid any potential reduction to the, the forgiveness amount for those employees. John, do you want to talk a little bit? Um, you talked about that. Um, FTE calculation, you talked about the cover period over the base period, which is either the June 15th, I'm sorry, February 15th through June 15th, or the 1120 to 229. Do you want to talk any more about what happens after that, or no, <laughs> which is fine? Are you referring to the potential exemptions? Uh, I'm referring, yeah, more to, not as much to the exemptions as to how you might do that FTE calculation, sure. what that might look like. Yeah, yeah, no, no, happy to, to give an example of, of what that looks like. So um, let, let me give an example really quick. So say that at the end of, uh, of your covered, your eight-week covered period that you're allowed to use the loan system, say a borrower has $100,000 in forgivable uses uh, of the loan. Um, well, when you're calculating your FTE reduction, um, say you're non-seasonal business, so you have the option of either electing to use the February 15th, 2019 through June 30th, 2019 period, or January 1st, 2020 through February 29th, 2020. So depending on what historical comparable period you're gonna, you're gonna elect to use, that's gonna be your denominator and kind of the, the fraction that's gonna be applied to your forgivable reduction. So, if during the if during the eight week covered period you have eight full time equivalents and your comparable historical period that you selected you have ten, essentially you would look at that and say, okay, I've got eight during the covered period. I used to have ten during the historical period. I have a reduction of two essentially. The equation to do that is going to be you're going to take your your number of average uh, FTEs during the covered period, the eight in this example. You're going to divide that by the 10. That's going to give you 80%. You're going to take 1 minus that 80%, which is going to give you 20%. And you're going to multiply that 20% times the $100,000 of forgivable uses that you have during the covered period. So at the end of the day, for reducing your headcount by 2 from 10 to 8, you're going to get $20,000 reduction in your forgivable uses of the loan proceeds, which is going to reduce your forgiveness amount from $100,000 to $80,000. So, Erica, I think that was probably clear as mud for everybody on the, on, on the webinar, <laughs> but I, I tried my best on the fly to give a, a relevant example. Oh, you did good. So, here, here's the reason for me bringing it up, even though you can't picture it, and maybe you're one of those picture people, because that's who I am. Um, the more times you hear the words and try to draw the pictures, the better off you're ultimately going to be, uh, even though we need SBA to come out and draw the pictures for us. And I think they will. I think what they have done in their interim final rules is give examples of how these things work. And we're going to talk about that on the next slide because we're going to talk about self-employed individuals. Um, so, so I think that uh, there's hope for us on this. The salary and wage deduction is weird. If, if the FTEs aren't weird, this is, if they are weird, then salary and wages is weirder. Don't ask me to give an example I'm of that. Not, I'm not. I'm not. I can't I'm not do asking. it. <laughs> I'm not asking. Uh, I was just going to say, so the FTE thing is a percent. The salary and wage thing is a dollar for dollar difference. Um, I've done some practice calculations, and I've learned that I'm not very good at math. I told John that yesterday. I, you know, I didn't grow up with calculators. I took the CPA exam without a calculator uh, or a computer or anything else. Uh, but scratch paper, maybe some of you can relate. Maybe most of you are like, oh, my God. But anyway, uh, uh, the calculations I've done, that salary and wage change is de minimis. It's just really not going to make that big of a difference. It's that... 20% change you can get from that FTE calculation. That's scary. And um, 
and that's why we think that these uh, exemptions to the reductions, I hate stuff like that, uh, an exemption from the reduction, uh, if you get everything, the FTEs back uh, to pre-February 15th levels or the February 15th level, oh, the, the earlier quarter, I remember, uh, then you don't have to worry about that reduction. That's why that's so important. Um, okay, let's talk well, about... Really quick, Erica, just to, sure. just to clarify one thing. You've heard me probably say a couple different times, if you're a non-seasonal business, you have right. the option of choosing those, those two historical periods for the purpose of the FTE calculation. If you qualify as a seasonal business, right now the, care, the, the guidance that's in the CARES Act will point that you have to use the February 15, 2019 through the June 30, 2019 time period. So again, likely some clarification on that when new guidance comes out. But right now, if you're a seasonal business, and if you're wondering if you're a seasonal business and you've already received your loan proceeds, that should have been part of your application on the front end, whether or not you were a seasonal business. So if you are seasonal, then you're going to have to use that February 15, 2019 through June 30th, 2019. Okay, thank you. Yep, that's important. Um, so let's talk about self-employed individuals. So these interim final rules, uh, there are six of them right now. And separate and apart from that are these frequently asked questions. There are 42 questions and answers. Um, and they might change more than one time a day, um, like yesterday. Uh, so um, in the third interim final rule, the third IFR, they gave us, long after it was important, the uh, means by which self-employed individuals and that's very narrowly defined in this instance, should calculate payroll costs and therefore calculate their maximum loan amount. So self-employed individuals and the third IFR refers only to people who file a Schedule C with a Form 1040. So in that particular interim final rule, it's not talking about people who get a K-1 from a partnership or an S corporation. Uh, it's talking about people who file a Schedule C on Form 1040, and as a result of uh, as a result of the narrow nature uh, of the of the third interim final rule, it can have some really weird results. So here's what I mean. So the first point on the slide is that owner's compensation, owner compensation replacement, is limited to eight weeks worth of 2019 net profit. On a Schedule C, apparently, the 2019 IRS Form 1040 Schedule C, that's on line 31. So let's just pretend that you had a net profit on line 31 of Schedule C for the 2019 IRS Form 1040, um, and it was more than $100,000. Well, the first thing it does is cap that at $100,000. And then it says um, you can only get eight weeks worth of that um, $100,000 or 8.50 seconds, which is $15,385. So if you are an owner um, of a business and you file a Schedule C, and you usually take out of the business over the course of the year uh, $10,000 a month. Uh, and then when you get to the end of the year, you have negligible uh, net profit. Um, you're not going to come anywhere near getting that $10,000 a month or something like that, $20,000 for I get close to twenty thousand dollars, fifteen thousand three hundred eighty-five. But you can see, depending on those numbers, how that's going to come out. Um, it's going to be limited to this fifteen thousand three hundred eighty-five. If you um, take a cue from this um, eight weeks um, language in this third F IFR, and you apply it to all the other places where it says that um, employee wages are capped at a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, then 
when you calculate your employees' wages for various purposes, if they're a person who makes more than $100,000, you're going to use 15385 If you pay monthly, that number would turn out to be 16667 But no, we're doing it weekly, folks. So it's going to be 15385 um, John and I have talked about... Uh, rent and utility payments a little bit. We, we think that the rule says, this interim final rule says that rent and utility payments have to be deductible. Uh, well, we know it says that. Uh, it has to be rent or utility payments that you would deduct on your Schedule C uh, before you can claim it as a forgivable cost uh, if you're a self-employed individual. Uh, now, one of the questions that has been raised um, a lot is um, whether or not if I, let, let's say I, um, I lease trucks. That's my business. My business is leasing trucks. And I buy trucks uh, and use floor plan financing. And I also uh, rent trucks from somebody else, a third party, and then re-rent them or I lease them and re-lease them to somebody else. Um, Erica, earlier you said that uh, interest on personal property counted, although you did say that you weren't 100% sure about uh, floor plan financing, but we'll say yes. So what about rent on personal property? Rent on real property counts. Um, that's the equivalent to mortgage interest, rent on real property. Uh, so what about um, personal property? Well. Here's what the third IFR says in the context of a Schedule C person. It gives an example. Remember I told you that those examples were good? Well, this is one time where I'm not so sure this is a good example. And that example says um, if you are a, an individual and you file a Schedule C and you use your car for business purposes, then you can deduct the interest on your car loan. You can count the interest on your car loan and you can count your payments on your car loan for these eight weeks um, if you deduct those things on your Schedule C. Oh, well, Erica, if a Schedule C person can deduct the payment, the principal payment on their car loan, then why can't I deduct in my C Corp or S Corp or partnership the rent payments or lease payment on the trucks that I'm leasing that I'm releasing. Well, I'm not saying that you can't, nor am I saying that you can. <laughs> so I think that um, whoever wrote the third interim final rule got a little carried away um, on this one. <laughs> uh, I don't think that Congress meant for businesses to be able to deduct expenses uh, paid for like copy machines, if you lease your copy machine, uh, or if you lease um, corporate vehicles for business use for your employees, salespeople perhaps. I don't think that was intended. What I think when we see mortgage interest on real property and rent and utilities is that we're talking about occupancy costs. And lease payments on inventory, like my trucks, that's not occupancy costs. But the SBA went there, about 1040s. So generally speaking, we would say that those rules in that, in that third interim final rule would apply to other business entities, like uh, partnerships and S-Corps. But this one, we don't know. I know that's going to frustrate you. Uh, we're frustrated too, and I'm sorry about that. But but I'll tell you what, if I spent it that way, if I were you, if I, if I used my loan proceeds that way, I think that you certainly have a good case for doing that. Just, just don't be surprised if it's not forgivable uh, if you go that route. Um, so just keep that in mind. Now, we're going to sum that up. John's going to sum all that up for you, uh, what we've been talking about. And then uh, we're going to take your questions. Yeah, so yeah. Gave, you, gave you a lot of information here um, about, you know, the, the loan forgiveness period, what the allowable costs are, things to keep in mind, potential reductions, but, but, but what are the key takeaways? And, and 
that there's a few bullets on the, on the slide here that we'll cover. Um, you know, first, make sure you're calculating that end date correctly that we talked about for the eight-week period. You want to make sure that you don't have that incorrect to where you're off by a day and on the on the back end, you think you have until X day to spend the loan proceeds, which we're, which in, in reality it was the day before, and so you're missing a portion of that. Make sure you're calculating that from eight weeks of the date that you got your disbursement of the loan from the lender. Second, once you get that loan, just go ahead and calculate 75% of that loan amount. Try to spend at least that amount on eligible payroll costs during the cover period, during the eight-week period. Thirdly, work to restore any reductions in full-time equivalent employees and or employee salary and wages to February 15th, 2020 levels. And you want to try to do that by June 30th, 2020. If there, any, if there were any reductions, um, you want to make sure you're trying to restore those um, to February 15th, 2020 levels. We don't know exactly how that's going to work, like Erica and I have mentioned. We don't know the, the, the components of what that calculation is, is going to look like at this point, but we know if you're in your covered period right now and you're trying to think about how to spend that, that money during the eight weeks, try to, try to maintain those historical levels of FDEs and employee salary. Levels. And then lastly, I mentioned it on the documentation slide, but it's going to be of, of, uh, of utmost importance um, um, for, for getting this piece is make sure you're communicating with your lender. Um, depending on the lender that you went through for the loan application, um, we've heard numerous instances where certain lenders require more extensive documentation, some require less. Um, I think it's going to be the same on the forgiveness side of things. The application forms may look slightly different from lender to lender. So make sure that you are com communicating with them to understand exactly what is going to be um, they're going to require for the application process. Yeah, so on that point, um, the statute says no documentation, no forgiveness. So you're only going to get forgiveness for what you can document, which is why we have been underscoring the importance of this particular item. John, thank you very much. Jenny, thank you very much. And to each of you, thank you for your time this afternoon. We trust that this has been helpful. And uh, right there we are if we can be of service to you. So thanks so much.